Uh, the, the overview is basically we're trying to build a program at, at our campus uh, to really have some practical solutions and, and help you guys out and our community out um, in a world that's increasingly kind of crazy. Some of the things that we use are service learning, this, this notion of service learning or applied stuff that has value to the community. Something I call conservation mechatronics, which I'll talk about as an example of, of our new way of doing it. And then just some of the example of some of the research our students are doing and what we're hoping to do in the future. I love the sign. So <laughs> we're, we are obviously, obviously are in some strange times right now. Um, at least well, in terms of. Is not you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm not accused of being an introvert too much, but but we really are in uh, in difficult times for folks that are uh, technical or 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 scientifically inclined, unfortunately. So we have a whole host of things. So so environmental challenges seem to be getting uh, crazier and crazier. In this case, this is Hurricane Harvey a few months ago, about to strike. Uh, uh, the Texas coast, Houston. So we have, as we know, things like the Thomas Fire and all this jazz, which, which uh, tangentially or, 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 or tangibly, excuse me, are really, really um, uh, both challenging, but also oftentimes unprecedented in terms of the scale or magnitude of impact. We have this growing regulatory bureaucracy, which. Um, oftentimes can get in the way of effective management. And so in this case, we're looking at the Santa Clara River estuary, looking south down the coast or southeast down the coast. And what you see in the foreground there, that's the, those are the camping areas that we've not been able to use for the past many years because of the impoundment of the Santa Clara River estuary to the right and stuff is completely flooded. And But one small example of this is on one of the... I, I, I help review some of the... Um, some of the technical documents uh, that have been proposed to deal with um, discharge from the Ventura uh, wastewater treatment facility, et cetera. And, and, and at one meeting, I, try, I like to delude myself into thinking that I'm actually you know, reasonable and sane and things like that. And, and I like to think that I can interact with all kinds of stakeholder groups and, and be normal. But this case, drives me crazy. So we had we have a, a discharge right there in the estuary and we have the along the, the right hand side that which you can't quite see is uh, a dredging that happens every year to dredge out the harbor. So we have a 36 inch pipe that goes there, discharges uh, a sediment. Ventura uh, Harbor, right? That's right, that's right. Sucked out of Ventura Harbor, dumped on the beach, beach nourishment, etc. And so I proposed and, and so there's basically a lot of hydrological models that were being proposed that if some of my freshmen had proposed those, I would fail them in the class. They were way too simplistic. They were Excel spreadsheet level simplicity. And, uh, and so to help alleviate the controversy, I said, why don't we just plumb up, why don't we just plumb up the discharge pipe, which is very, very close to where it says June, June 5th there. And, and then just, we can throw that water straight out into the ocean as opposed to the estuary. And we can test the hypothesis that that the water level is being maintained by this discharge or is it something else like the, the watering of the crops in the field to the left? And this gentleman in this, in this broad stakeholder meeting said, you'll never get an ocean discharge permit. And I said, well, you know, I, I know it's hard and everything, but we should try. No, you'll never get an ocean discharge permit. I said, no, I know, but, but we really need to, uh, you know, I th this would really, this, you know, otherwise we're gonna spend millions of dollars, as was, which is the proposed solution, that the treatment facility spend millions of dollars do a treatment wetland, which I love treatment wetlands, so I'm all for that. But, but you know, do we really need to do that to solve this problem? And we could spend, you know, the Cadillac version would have been a hundred thousand dollars. We could probably spend twenty-five, thirty-five thousand dollars running a few hundred yards of pipe into, you know, in a T intersection into that into that discharge pipe, and we would know very quickly with a little, you know, simple valve uh, if in the summertime by shunting this water straight offshore as opposed to first into the estuary, if that started to make the water level drop, easy, you know, just turn the valve and we would stop it, right? Very simple, straightforward solution. No, the guy said, you'll never get an ocean discharge permit. And I started getting really hot under the collar. And I said, well, then we should just, we should ask for it. And he said, I know you're never gonna get an ocean discharge permit because the Army Corps issues those and I'm the guy from Army Corps that issues those. Oh. And, and I started saying bad words and then, and then the, uh, <laughs> the moderator said, thank you, Dr. Anderson, thank you. I really appreciate that, but I think we're gonna move on now. So the notion of, you know, we have so, so many wonderful 
laws and policies to protect our environment and human health, which are great, but sometimes they take on a life of their own and they become counterproductive. And they lead the community to think that these laws are not for human health, not for environmental protection, they're for some kind of other political agenda, and then we lose. So dealing with these regulatory bureaucracies to make sure they're really working um, is, a, is a huge challenge. We've had this wide, simultaneously, we've had this wide, broad uh, disinvestment in public higher education. So just but one small example, this is from last, this from this week, early this week, but um, the pro governor's proposed budget to the CSU system, my university system, which is the largest public institu uh, education institution in the US with half a million students, to just meet the required additional students that the state has required us to take, we need $268 million. They propose to give us $90 million. So that's one third of our budget. So this is an ongoing thing, not just with our university, not just with our state, but broadly across the US, this, this very long-term disinvestment in public higher ed. And then, and then lastly, this, this current era of this very concerted very clear, and these, these, this is from a couple days ago, and then the one on the right is from a couple hours ago. But the, uh, the, the US EPA has now decided that they're, they're going to remove the waiver for the state of California. And so our, 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 our fuel standards, uh, the, the corporate average fuel efficiency standards are gonna change, they're gonna wanna lower those. And of, of course, all the associated stuff with emissions and human health and, and, and climate change and all this and that. So clearly the state of California is gonna sue about that, but, but still this notion of, you know, we can disagree on how to get to where we wanna go, but this current era of anti-facts, anti-reality is a, is, a, is, a, is a true challenge for us and our students. So my department is called Environmental Science and Resource Management. JLA over there is a product of that, yay, Yahoo. Um, and, and I wanna talk a little bit about our program to give you guys the context. So it's environmental science and resource management. We, it's way too long to say. So we always simply say ESRM. And we, my program is really designed to get students employed with you guys, employed with agencies, entry level field scientists from the get go. Not to spend six months training them up on CEQA or what is this or how do we do stuff. Rather spend you know, a week or two training them up on your particular workflows and get them going. So we're driven by this, this teacher-scholar philosophy. So importantly there it says teacher-scholar, not scholar-teacher. Um, and so we really do believe very much so in being kick-butt teachers and being very, very effective educators. And we believe strongly in that in our campus, but it's particularly in terms of my department. Um, so we've not rehired people because they're not a, a great teacher. And so we really do walk the talk there. Um, we've developed a curriculum that has research permeated throughout, both outside the course, uh, formal coursework, but also inside the cor coursework, mostly driven by applied questions, applied monitoring, applied assessment, that kind of stuff. Oftentimes community-based with you guys providing the challenges for us, or you guys coming to us and saying, hey, we'd really like to know X, or we need to know whatever. And then the buzzword for some of this that, that we've just been doing for years, but is, is the current buzzword is this notion of service learning. So we could learn about something in the abstract or with a theoretical model. We prefer to embed the students with you guys or to do a project where they have a deliverable to an agency, to a consulting firm, to a, to a, uh, uh, a Native American tribe, something like that. We're very interdisciplinary. Our students take two years of basically just foundational stuff, not just in the sciences, but also in the humanities, social sciences. We really are a multicultural campus diverse perspectives. One time I was giving, I'll talk about drones in a little bit, but we do a lot with drones. We're now recognized as one of the leaders in the, in the Western US in terms of this technology. But I was giving a talk to another university that shall be unnamed in California. And I said, one of our strengths with drones is that we're multicultural and we have really diverse students. And this engineering professor, very sweet man, he said, I don't, why did you, what was that bullet point? And I said, oh, we're diverse. And he said, yeah, why is that good? And I said, well, because people, you know, have, have different thinking and they come to the problem with different approaches and he he just could not get his head around he didn't think that was bad per se but he didn't see it as a strength we see this as a strength most of our students are first generation college goers um, we have a lot of veterans uh, GI Bill folks and and that to to me is is one of the things that that makes me proud of our institution and and happy to go to work each day and then 
again, we really emphasize the, the practical field oriented um, deliverable skill sets that we uh, build around the department. And our, our primary metric is student success. So is how well are our students doing? And so this, this slide just features the guy with the glasses on. And so on the left, he's speaking to Oxnard middle school kids. On the right, he's at the DARPA uh, uh, Robotics Challenge, which we were invited to, to participate in. On the, the right down over there, he's been hired and he's now giving a training seminar to my fellow uh, faculty member and myself. On the left, he's piloting a new um, augmented reality interface that we were uh, developing for one of our robots. So, so that is our measure of success. Yes, we like to publish papers. Yes, we like to get grants, all that kind of good stuff. But really, our main thing that gets us up in the morning is seeing our students do kick butt work and go on to do kick butt work after they leave us. We really also see our program, our ESRM program is really this, and sometimes people say this kind of stuff and it's a little kind of boilerplate and it's a little you know, blah blah and touchy feel good. No, for us it really is true. So we have this very strong interplay between our research, our teaching and learning, and our service and it all feeds back um, upon us, upon one another. Um, so here we go, so if you have to fall asleep now or finish your steak or whatever, whatever your chicken or salmon, whatever you're not, so if you totally fall asleep, you can just remember this. So I, I suggest that you have to understand, to understand our campus, you need to properly understand the, the unique point in time that we are at in our country, in our world, and that really frames what we're trying to do. And then as one example here, I'm gonna run through our, our work with robots as an example of merging what we're trying to do by taking physical stuff, equipment, and merge it with this philosophy that I've been mentioning, this, this, this teaching scholar uh, model. And, and the example we'll talk about is this notion of this conservation mechatronics. And then I'll run through some examples of other research that we're doing, student-based research, to give you guys a feel for what we're, we're working on. Um, again, interrupt me if I'm going too long or this isn't, isn't uh, making sense. But so uh, a key thing, is this a key thing to our success is this thing right here this this smartphone and that's our blog we, we do a lot of blogging that's our blog but we truly are and again in this this current era of insane lack of people acknowledging reality and screaming fake news and stuff it, it's 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 easy to forget that we really are in this tremendously magical time and so the fact that we can put this thing in our pocket uh you know just insane so much more powerful than all the computers that ran the space shuttle and and on and on and on. Microprocessor speed has crashed uh, tremendously in recent years. That's called Moore's Law. That's right, that's right. And so right now it's having about every, slightly, slightly more than every year. And, and the co not only is the speed uh, you know, getting faster, the cost is dropping. More importantly than just those things, that thing, that, that cell phone behind, in the background, that smartphone, um, has driven a huge amount of technological innovation. So first and foremost, very low power draws in terms of the, the, the circuitry and the, and the circuits that are running on there. Very cheap, very accurate, all kinds of wonderful, because everybody wants to play the racing games, very, very accurate, you know, tilt centers, uh, 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 compasses, all those things, incredibly um, powerful and helpful. That's secure. Uh, right, exactly. Yeah, that, that's, all, that's, a, that's a different question. That's a different question. But... Uh, we're really now entering the fourth, so-called fourth industrial revolution. But what we do in, in our program, one thing that, that, that um, helps make this real is we can do a lot of this manufacturing ourselves. When I was an undergrad at UCSB, I had the, the fools gave me a key to the machine shop and I would build a lot of the equipment we needed to do field monitoring, uh, uh, collectors, uh, all kinds of things. When I went to UCLA, it was a union shop. When I went to UCLA, they said, yeah, we can build that for you. It's 60 bucks an hour. What grant do I charge it to? And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa what? Um, at Stanford, we had uh, a wonderful place, which was uh, every student paid 25 or something, 50 bucks a semester, or actually a quarter, and they uh, got access to 3D printers, laser lathes, all these wonderful things. So we've done um, as best we can in my lab to replicate that. So we have essentially a maker space in our lab. So amongst other things, we have a, a cadre of 3D printers that, that, are, that are run by students, that are used by students that can make stuff. And, and we're getting, and we mostly print, it, print in plastic, but you can print in wood, you can print in metal, you can print in chocolate, you can print just about in anything you want. 
Um, and more materials with all kinds of wonderful properties are coming out daily. Secondly, we, have, we use a lot of open source technology in my lab. So one, that's cheap. Two, it means students can port that with them to you guys or whatever firm or agency they, they, they choose to use. Um, fantastic for both creation but also for sharing stuff. So a lot of stuff that we create, we put on the web. Uh, other labs, other schools, other entities can use it and they refine it and then it's a wonderful, uh, much, much faster development period than if everything was privatized and everything was was copyright protected. And then of course the, this all amounts to the maker movement in general. So here's our campus and I believe this is a, a pretty unique special place. Um, as, as I mentioned before, we really not only tolerate but we encourage new thinking, very much so. We're this baby campus, right? So if you look at our logo, it says established 2002, that's baloney. We didn't take our first freshman until 2004. We didn't graduate our first freshman class until 2008. So we really are more like, you know, just over a decade old. So we're, we're still very small in the grand scheme of things. We still are very much in a startup mode, in, a, in an incubator type mode. Everything is new. Everything has either just been built or needs to be built. We have this, as I mentioned, this very diverse student body that, that is dominated by traditionally underrepresented groups in higher ed. And our program in particular, as I mentioned, a very interdisciplinary, applied focus, field-oriented focus, and, ha and this service learning um, a focus that's really important. And so that leads to all kinds of great stuff. So our work on the left up there is, is at Port Wainimi with the, uh, our new center with a, with a giant 30-foot tank that we can test ROVs in students giving presentations, all kinds of killer stuff. And the actual physical plan of our campus is unique. So this is on our campus. This was a former uh, dairy. And, and so this is this um, crazy old hay barn that was built seven, whatever, 80 odd years ago. And this looks to most people like lame thing. It's, it's an unused barn, it sucks. There's all this graffiti on it. For us, it's fantastic. When the FAA was being even more stupid than they currently are uh, and weren't letting us fly drones, for a whole variety of reasons, um, we could fly drones in here. So this was considered an indoor space, but if you notice, there's no walls. So the students could l begin to learn to fly in here, but yet have real wind, real environmental conditions. So it met all the legal constraints, provided a safe definition of area they could move around, and, um, and was, just, was just fantastic. So we have, we have unique facilities at our campus that no one else has. We also have an airstrip. Nobody else has an airstrip. We have a 25-year-old airstrip that we can launch ROVs from. Um, policies, I'll talk about that in a second, policies that really um, f uh, really encourage collaboration with you guys. Partnerships, some of you guys in the room we have existing partnerships with. And then all this really cool talent where a lot of young, innovative faculty members from Eastern Europe, from Alaska, from other places that maybe wouldn't historically have come to coastal California because it's too expensive, because of some of the housing and other things we've put into place, we've been able to attract m amazingly talented faculty um, that you historically wouldn't get at a small Cal State in, you know, the, in, in Ventura, California. We've actually been, been quite good at that. Again, we take a different approach than most universities have traditionally taken. We have an educational focus, applied <coughs> research, and interdisciplinary focus. And that amounts to all kinds of things. So these are my students and, and, and fellow faculty, et cetera, in the hills above Ventura after the fire. So we're out there monitoring with some of our robots, in this case, the Ventura Botanical Garden. And where's our first, where's his refrigerator, the first guy? Uh, he's a computer scientist, so he obviously didn't, didn't put it on. He <laughs> took it off because he wanted to have his face showing because he's a computer scientist because he thinks that's important. He's selfieing or whatever. So. Um, so, okay, so, so then the, the quick example before I get into other um, research examples, I just want to talk about our use of robots and how I think that illustrates the things we're trying to do differently at our campus. It starts with equipment and materials and leads to this, this philosophy and this new policy and that in turn feeds back uh, to equipment and stuff. So this is how it all started. So about six, seven years ago, we were approached and, and some folks that had built, this is a delta wing, this thing's about four feet uh, from, from wingtip to wingtip. Um, this was built for the Department of Defense to, to essentially test out some communication uh, protocols. It was what we now call a drone. This was built in about the year 2000. It's, it's very old tech now, it's totally outdated. 
It's crashed several times. That's why it looks like there's some cracks up there. And so these folks said, hey, do you guys want this old, you know, no longer high tech, whatever, just old drone? And so I and some of my colleagues said, totally, we want that. Yeah. So yeah, okay, so we were going through the process, getting the equipment, and then going through the gifting process. And our then president, our founding president, um, uh, President uh, Dick Rush, he said, surprisingly, no. He declined the gift. And so I and several colleagues said, what? No, 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 we want to use this new tech because again, this is the kind of stuff we want to train our students in, right? Add another arrow in their quiver so that if they go to work for you guys and you need to do some air sampling or some whatever mapping that they know how to do this. And so he said, no, we're not going to get into drones. People associate drones with Afghanistan, Iraq. They associate with blowing stuff up, spying on people, all this and that. And so I said, no, no, we don't want to do that. And to his credit, President Rush said, okay, well, maybe I'm wrong, but I am worried about this stuff and I'm worried about the perception. So what you need to do is you need to go make a policy that assures me that we won't blow stuff up and we won't spy on people and we won't this and that. And I thought, oh my God, oh my God, this is gonna suck, right? Because I hate doing stuff. The reality is this is a really true concern. This is LAPD. When they got their drones, where did LAPD get their drones? They bought it from the Seattle Police Department. Why are they buying it from the Seattle Police Department? Because people in Seattle were ticked off and didn't want drones. So they said, let's sell them, and LAPD said, we'll take it. Rather than engaging the public and having a dialogue about, should we use this technology or what's the appropriate use of the technology, they ran to the technology first, and it's caused all kinds of, of backlash for them. So this notion that our president was voicing was really valid. So we ended up spending a year and a half creating this thing on the left, which is uh, our unmanned systems policy. And, and you know, here I thought every 12 year old going on Amazon buying one of these drones and they're flying them and then we who want to teach people how to responsibly use this, we're not allowed to do it and it was just, you know, talking to lawyers, the bane of my existence and, you know, our lawyers, the system lawyers, people from the state, oh my god, I can't stand this stuff. So anyway, we make this policy. So here I'm thinking we're this little, you know, backwater, small little university that's doing this and, and everybody else and their brother is flying these things and we're just like idiots. It turns out um, we were in front of everybody. And so our policy, there's, there's more to the story, but the short version is our policy is now required or something exceeding that policy is required of all the 23 campuses across the state. Uh, I advise universities in Colorado and community colleges in downtown LA and the UC has borrowed several elements of this in their policy. So now we're looked at as the leaders in drone education. It was like, wait, wait, what? You know, so, so again, because we have this first principles approach and let's make sure we're doing everything correct, legally appropriate, scientifically appropriate, safety wise appropriate, it's really opened a tremendous amount of doors. The other, the other way we've gotten our robotics work getting off the ground is again, we're a small, t you know, small Cal State, we're not, USC, we're not Stanford, we're not UCLA. We have a hard time competing with those entities in terms of the pure NSF type grants. Um, however, we're extremely competitive when it comes to educational grants. And actually we do okay with the NSF stuff too, but, but, but you know, um, but so our approach is to take an educational crowbar, slip that under the door, start with that funding, and then by the way, we're experts in this, and then we get r larger research dollars that follow. So this is one of our main underwater robotic uh, sampling devices. This is called Open ROV. This is made by a startup in Berkeley. And we're now one of the experts in this, so now we advise people around the world in terms of how to build this. So we do YouTube videos with people, Google chats, all kinds of stuff to help them. We most, just most recently built one for this NGO in East Africa for, um, for some education stuff they're doing. So we do that kind of stuff. But um, and this particular NOAA grant, which is under threat from the current administration because they don't think we should be doing education, education with Hispanic kids, and any work on changing environment. They, they don't think that's uh, worthy of our public dollars. But, but so far we have, you know, we still have this year, we still have some money. But so we take that money and we do stuff. So in this case, this is an effort with high, a local high school in Oxnard. So we collaborate with them and our students. We also collaborate with middle school folks and it turns out that that ROV is a little bit much for the middle school kids, but this ROV is the perfect scale for them. They can talk about hydrodynamics, they can build their own PVC frames, they can experiment with, with drag and all that kind of stuff. So we do all kinds of neat stuff with that. 
Our students, meanwhile, are learning how to build these units. This is in our old lab. And we have a wonderful peer-to-peer -peer network. So our, our students that know nothing come in and watch YouTube videos. What is soldering? What the hell is electricity? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so they learn that. And then they start on some very simple stuff mentored by the intermediate students. The intermediate students are mentored by the advanced students. The advanced students are mentored by the faculty. So it's really this peer-to-peer -peer thing that's worked fantastically well both within our campus and with our collaboration with the community colleges and uh, the local local school districts. Um, and not only, not only our, our formal research, but also we are the home for the Ventura County Office of Education's High School Air Academy. So this is one of our converted classrooms. And you can see on the back wall there, there's, our, there's one of our two original units. And this is a program where students come once a week that are in high school and they um, they learn how to build drones, they learn how to fly drones, all that kind of stuff. They get their FAA 107 certification, et cetera. And it, in effect, is a maker space that our, our high school students can use. We were bursting at the seams in our old labs. This was in 2015. Everybody's on top of each other. There's stuff laid everywhere, and it's just crazy. These are our new lab spaces. We just opened up a new building in fall of 2016 that has really transformed our program. In this case, this is our robotics lab. Um, we call my lab the Pirate Lab. It, we used to call it the Pacific Institute for Restoration Ecology, and then we had a policy change that said there's this po you can't just use the word institute. So they got angry with me, so I just started calling my lab the Pirate Lab, and then everybody says, what well, do you think, you're a pirate? What do you think, you're a rebel? Like, why are you calling it the Pirate Lab? And so in response to that, we were getting our robotics stuff going, and because we fly robots and swim robots, my students, in a very immature, shall you say, middle finger to the administration said, we're going to call our, our research group there the Pirate R Labs. So that's Aerial Aquatic Robotic Research. So that's our that's our R group. Um, so we've we've locked onto the notion of pirates, and now we talk about pirates all the time. But uh, but that's our space. Again, all kinds of 3D printers in the middle here. This is the largest 3D printer on campus that we use to print gimbals and other other uh, sensor holders and things like that. On the left is what's that one? The one on the left is. Um, that's, uh, where's that one from? That one is from China. That can print in two materials at once. So you can put a conductor and an insulator. You can make integrated circuits if you want on that one. And then we have another one from China and all kinds of other cool stuff. All of these are run by students. All of these are met, adapted by students. On the, on the right here, you will see a backup camera from a minivan. Turns out that has about not quite a 180 degree arc and works very well in low light. And sometimes these 3D printers screw up and it, it can take a long time to print something. So it's very common somebody says something to print, they go away, get a soda, go to class, whatever, come back. And if the print head has gotten screwed up, because it's very, very precise in terms of what it needs to lay down, it's, it's spooled out a whole bunch of plastic or whatever and wasted all this material. So they they set this up themselves. So now this guy is on its own IP address. They can check from their mobile phones what's going on. If it is screwing up, they can kill it remotely and not waste material. So again, our students are really, really creative and they have the, the, the wherewithal and they're encouraged to do this. They're encouraged to hack this up, change this up, mess around, play with us. So we've essentially recreated shop. When I went to high school, my, my generation was one of the first that didn't have shop. No car shop, no wood shop, no metal shop, because you're college bound, right? As if doing shop was somehow not conducive to a great career or whatever. So we've essentially recreated shop in, my, uh, in our labs. All of this, though, really gets back to teaching, teaching, teaching. This is our intro to drones class. Um, but again, because we're interdisciplinary, we take a broad approach to education. So of course, it's how do these things fly? How do the control systems work? But it's also, how is this technology perceived by the general public? So for example, we do, Jayla has done, uh, all kinds of uh, survey work. So we're curious as to how the public are interpreting this technology, not just, not just you know, this te all technology, all good. And so while well, there's all kinds of data I can show you, I'll just show you this one example. I have another example at the end if you're not totally bored with me by then. But, so this is uh, data from 2014. We, we survey about 1,000 to 1,500 people in Santa Barbara, Ventura, and LA counties each fall, asking them a variety of questions about coastal management, all this and that. We don't ask that much about air quality, but maybe we should talk to you guys and add in a couple more questions about that. But it's provided a wonderful, this is our, our 11th year or 12th year, I guess, that we've been doing this. So it makes a fantastic longitudinal data set to look at how different management actions have been perceived by the general public. In this case, 
In 2014, we, we have all kinds of other data, but this just serves to make the point. This is our 2014. So we said, how do you feel about small you know, drones, privately operated drones, you know, flying around you and being used in Ventura County, say? On the left, it's people that said they, they think this is a bad idea or a very bad idea. On the right, it's people that think it's a good idea or a very good idea. And this is where the conversation typically runs. If you read the newspapers, this is what people will say. So if you look at that, it's about two to one people that have a negative view about drones versus people that have a positive view. And that's usually how this conversation goes. Then people get angry at each other, yell at each other. That's baloney. That, that means virtually nothing. What really matters is the people that are neutral and the people that are right that are unsure. Yeah. If we add those guys together, we're talking about 60%, nearly two thirds of the public, and this has remained constant for the last several years. About, about two thirds of the public have not made up their mind. They don't think it's bad, they don't think it's great. That's where the interest is right now. Those folks can either say, this totally sucks, let's not do this, and this technology will not roll out further. These people can be supportive, and we'll see more use of this technology. So our polling and, our, and our, our interdisciplinary inquiry tells us this. So we've adapted how we do research. So when we do research, um, we can't always do it, but most times we have a person that just floats away from the people doing research to intercept the public. That keeps them from bugging the pilots and making them maybe not be safe, but they serve as a point of education. They, tell, they explain what we're doing, they give them literature, they point them to our website. And so the hope there is, that we can be engaged in the conversation positively, not necessarily saying we should do process X or process Y, but to be, to be a voice of, of honest information, rational discussion, and, and so we do that as well as our basic research as well. We also work a lot on communicating with the media. This is during the, the 2015 refugio oil spill. So we, we work a lot with our students in being able to communicate, talk to the general public. In this case, these guys are talking to uh, NBC News. And then with the most recent Thomas fire, nothing has changed. So same thing. So we, we speak with the media a lot. I speak with the media a lot. Our students speak with the media a lot. And, and that's invaluable training for them to engage uh, our various communities. OK, so that, that's, that's my, my quick run through of, of how, we're, how we're trying to do stuff or how, or how our program works. And again, nobody's asking questions because I'm talking too fast or something, I think. I have a question. Point. Yes. Can we have a tour? Of course you guys can have a tour. Absolutely. Not tomorrow. <laughs> Normally tomorrow would be great, but they just, because it's, it's a holiday for campus, Cesar Chavez Day, but uh, the power will be off during most of tomorrow. So anytime after tomorrow, absolutely. Fridays are great for us. We have our, our lab meetings on Fridays, so that would be great if you guys wanted to come in and give you a quick tour. We go have lunch. We can talk about how we might be able to partner with you guys. I, I would love that. That would be great. Um, the only question, that was an easy question. That was such a softball. Okay. <laughs> uh, the opening day of baseball season, you guys give me a softball. You paid me to do, say that, didn't there you? There you go, that's good. Okay, so I just wanted to show you guys some examples. Oh, sorry. Suggestion. Yeah, yeah. You can offer the negative part of drones. Mm -hmm. you, should offer, you should have like a monthly drone day and invite people to come out and learn how to fly and free. What a great example. What a great question. So we have our drone data race, uh, our second annual drone data race on April 14th. You guys are all welcome to come out. This is, yes, Dale? How did that first one go? Went really fantastically fun. well. So, uh, so, the idea, so the idea with that is, is exactly what you're talking about. It's, it's how do we engage the public and, and, and I'm worried about drones too. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say they're all perfect and idyllic, but we need to have rational conversations about them, not some of the fear mongering or, or say they're, they're the best thing since sliced bread that seems to sort of dominate the, the media coverage. And so one thing, I get all these calls of people wanting to start a drone business and they want to blah, blah, blah. And because of the the institutional, the, the FAA, the, the legal barriers, it's been very hard historically to start a, a drone business, say to map crops or to do one thing or another. And so as a consequence, we get mostly male dominated, mostly piloty kind of very techni technically oriented folks. And they get all the legal approvals and this and that. And they're like, I'm gonna go fly. Like, what do you do? I'm gonna go fly and make money. Can you tell me I make money? And and they are not focusing on the deliverable for the client. They're not, fo they're like, I'll make a map and give it to them. Whereas the farmer doesn't want a map. The farmer wants to know where do I put, where do I have, you know, nutrient limitation? Where do I have too much stress of my crops? That's what he or she wants to know. And these folks are not focused on the actual data product. 
So we've started, last year was our first year, this year is our second year, so-called drone data race. So also, because the FAA did all this crazy stuff, um, uh, you couldn't, or it was hard to fly outside in some context. So we have places like LA with all these vacant, massive numbers of vacant um, old warehouses. So what grew up sort of is this sort of counterculture thing, this notion of drone racing. So folks would go in, rent a, a warehouse for a month, so it was indoors, it was, it was not open air, so it didn't require any FAA approval, and they would set up courses, and folks would come in, they'd pay into a kitty, and they would do these, this racing, and everybody used these uh, 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 forward-facing camera, so they had these goggles on, and so it's like, uh, it's like Star Wars, like the Empire Strikes Back with the speeder bikes, and they go around, they crash, and everybody laughs and everything. And so these, these, dr these races, drone races, have become a huge thing. Now they're on ESPN. Um, uh, the, the pots of money in the international leagues are $500,000 if you win these things. They're becoming a real sport. And so we've tried to co-opt that in a sense, in the sort of the fun competition sense, but we've added a data component. So in our drone data race, which we hold on campus, and it's open to anybody. You guys can participate, as long as you have a drone. Uh, high schoolers can participate. <laughs> Uh, anybody can participate. And the idea is we have a course and they run through the course really quickly, but there's also, a, there's also because uh, we're trying to emphasize the power of this technology and the va potential value of this technology, they have to collect some amount of data. The first part of the race is just they have to count something. Last year was an oil spill. So the idea is we have an oil spill, let's deploy this unit to see if we get some rapid intelligence to inform the first responders. And so they had to count the number of, of barrels that were you know, the, the amount of oil that was spilled or, or the number of barrels that were spilled. And if they didn't get the number right, they were penalized in terms of time. So you could just do the race and we had winners there. And then we, after the race, formal race, we gave them 10 minutes on the course and they had to image the stress. Last year it was a, an oil spill. This year it's a wildfire, which we created the topic way before the Thomas fire, but still. Uh, so, <laughs> so, um, so you can win by just being the fastest person. You can win by creating the most elegant data product, broadly writ. So something that could be a value, value to first responders or, or agencies or whatever. And so you can use your artistic talents, you can use your speed talents, and you can win your overall stuff. So that's how we're trying to help build, build uh, community. And last year was our first year, and we got this massive interest. We had people who were going to fly down from San Francisco. And I said, whoa, 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 this is the first time. Maybe you don't want to fly. I mean, I don't, we're going to get two people show up or... So it was very, we had about 150 uh, obs um, observers just watching the race. So yeah, so, so we're doing stuff like that. But it's April 14th, Saturday. You guys are welcome to come out to campus. Um, I'm happy to send you guys the invite. We're not quite done with the invite. It'll probably be done in a day or so, but um, it's gonna be very fun. It's open to anybody. There's a kitty you pay in. It's free to watch, but if you wanna pay, you just bring your drone and, and, and that's, that's one of the ways we're, we're trying to engage the public in, in this stuff. Um, other questions? See, I'm, I'm rambling. I wanted to see if you could talk a little more about what you were doing in the hillsides after the fire. I will. So, so I, I have a, I I have a couple slides. Yeah, so this, this next is a, just sort of a smattering of what we're doing, but I'm happy to talk more in detail if I'm not, if I don't touch enough. Can um, I go back to yeah. the web page where somebody, like a kid, would yeah. sign up to yeah. do the... Uh, do the uh, drone data race? Uh, it's not live yet. It'll be live in a day or two. But if you go to AARR dot pirate lab dot org, <laughs> the link will be there. And there'll be a drone data race tab. And that'll be updated in about a day or so. <coughs> they just couldn't help themselves. <laughs> couldn't help themselves. Of course, I did not well, I discourage guess. it. But yeah, yes. But, um, uh, yeah, so, so absolutely. So, so we, we work on, again, trying to create a whole effective student that would be of value to you guys and your companies and your agencies. Uh, but this is uh, one of my students, Jerry, who's fantastic. He now works for the Army Corps. Uh, and he, um, he was a great guy, but very quiet. Not like me, he's very quiet. And so you know, he started working in our lab, and, and I said, okay, right. And after he had some experience, I said, hey, I want you to start analyzing some data. And he said, okay. And then I said, I want you to start going and presenting data. And he goes, I was like, yeah, okay, well, you're gonna do it anyway. Sorry, dude. And so we started sending him to meetings, and you know, it took a little bit, took a little bit longer, but uh, he was great. So, so in this case, this is him down at the chancellor's office in Long Beach, and you know, he'd go down and present something and talk. Um, well, pretty soon, out comes the governor, 
and the governor happened to be there for a board of trustees meeting and was supposed to walk around and look at everybody's poster. He ended up spending 15 minutes on our poster and not seeing anybody else's poster. And so, so our students have the ability to interact with the governor and things like that. And so we really are serious about working on their, their speaking. I don't have a picture of the governor talking to him because I, you know, I didn't take a picture, but, but, um, but those are, those are, we consider key research skills in addition to the data collection and that other stuff. Um, we do a lot of vetting of technology. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, in this case, so we're poor, right? So on the left there, that's our VR goggles. You might think it's a, it's a welding headset, and it is, but we've, <laughs> we've hacked out the piece of glass and we've put in a little display screen. So we do a lot of vetting of tech. We do a lot of perpetual learning myself. This is our field lab in Aitutaki uh, in the Cook Islands. Um, and so we bring all this stuff with us. We have to be able to, a lot of these robotic things break all the time. They break underwater, they break in the air. So we have to be able to repair them on the fly and um, you know, great skill sets. I don't repair them on the fly, I have my students repair them, but yeah, they're learning great skill sets. Um, and then we have all kinds of really neat things we can do. In this case, these are, this is Cliffs up in Santa Barbara. This is an example. This is all with a, a store-bought, this is a program we use, we become really expert with it called Pix4D. It's a photo stitching platform and we're just running through the model here since we're not on the internet right now, I'm just, this is a recorded video, but, but you, this is a three-dimensional space that we've created from a flying over with drones, so you can use them to count bird nests, to look at oil spills, all kinds of stuff. We take two-dimensional photographs, the computer stitches them together, creates a three-dimensional topology, and then restretches the photographs over them. So we can do very accurate um, measurements. We're getting now to the point with our, with our LiDAR that we're actually sub-centimeter accuracy, so we can do all kinds of wonderful uh, measurements. We can do one flight, for example, over this cliff area. Maybe there's an endangered species, so it's hard to get to, or we don't want to disturb them. Do one flight and then come back and do the, and do the analysis in the lab without disturbing that organism or, or the, the residents or whatever the case may be. Um, we use our robots not only in the air, underwater. In this case, we're using them to count fish in a marine protected area versus inside versus outside. This is at our research station on Santa Rosa Island. This is last week. This is, this is what is this? This is three days ago, uh, two days ago, um, in Louisiana. <clears throat> so these are the guy on the right is the the director of the botanical garden from UCLA. The guy on the left is a professor of horticulture from Oregon State. The guy in the middle is one of our undergrads who's just about to graduate, looking for a job. Hint, hint. Um, uh, and what he, so the, we're doing is we're in this case we're doing wetland restoration in a bottomland hardwood swamp in Louisiana. And uh, we're, we're, we're measuring the demography of trees and, and we're trying to calibrate our observations by using the drone. So the drone is right here. In this case, this is a thing called an Inspire One. And so, so these units are such that we can take them around the world, we can throw them up in the canopy, we can do all this wonderful stuff and adapt them to a whole variety of needs, not only this kind of stuff, but also air quality monitoring, thermal uh, imaging, all kinds of uh, neat stuff by just swapping out the sensors on the belly. Um, because we have this focus on interdisciplinarity, this is this class that Jayla has come with us, I just returned. So these are undergrads that come from across campus. They tend to mostly be my majors, but, but they, every, it's open to anybody on campus, nursing majors, sociology folks. And this is our work in Louisiana where we not only do wetland restoration, we, do, we install food gardens in neighborhoods that don't have access to clean, healthy food, and we embed in the local culture. So we embed in the music community, the chef community, the, with the politicians, the business community, et cetera. And again, these are folks that normally are working at least part-time, if not sometimes close to full-time to pay for school. So we have mechanisms in place to, to subsidize their travel. They otherwise wouldn't be able to afford this. And so, so I take students to, to in spring break to Louisiana. My colleague, Don Rodriguez, takes students to Costa Rica. We take students to Hawaii, to the Cook Islands, all around, and that's just my program. Other programs do, uh, I would say they don't do the same level of service that we do, but they do neat projects all around the world. Um, and they apply and all that kind of good stuff. Okay, other examples of research that we do. This is, this is some of our work in the deep water, with the Deepwater Horizon. The initial conceptual problem with Deepwater Horizon is that we were using an incorrect mental model. So we were using the existing oil spill paradigm, which came from pipeline breaks and tanker uh, collisions and tanker spills, which was primarily a surface spill phenomenon. We just assumed, we just took that old paradigm, 
which there's a little deposition in, in, in local sediments, and then you know a lot of volatilization of some of the uh, light uh, hydrocarbons, and then a lot of the oil was on the surface, killing poor little birdies and stuff, and then hitting the beach and causing you know beach deposition or wetland deposition. And all we did, I was just as guilty of this initially, is we just took that uh, uh, shallow water model and moved it down and assumed the same thing was happening when the deep water horizon happened at almost 1,500 meters down. That was totally wrong, and that, was, that led to all kinds of misapplication of resources and money and all kinds of stuff. Um, this is the real model that we've, that we've published that, that's really what happened. The vast, so oil at that depth and pressure is actually not positively buoyant, it's actually negative. So the only reason why oil went squirted out of the bottom was because of the, uh, the pressure um, of the subsurface reserve and so it shot up. Most of that oil, uh, it was mostly a methane phenomenon, it wasn't, it was oil as well, but it was mostly a methane spill. That dispersed methane and oil um, mostly hung out between 1200 meters and 1400 meters in this diverse, uh, uh, dispersed, uh, 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 very um, widely, uh, wide-ranging uh, plume. Stuff obviously made it to the surface. The stuff that made it to the surface was fairly weathered at that point. Not a lot of, comparatively, not a lot of volatiles there. Uh, and, and so when we attacked it uh, with traditional surface uh, dispersants, uh, 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 aerial de deployed dispersants as we've done in the past, the real innovation was to actually take ROVs and a hose down and actually deploy the dispersants down at the wellhead, which was a fantastic idea. Knowing what we knew then, absolutely. I totally supported it. It was great. You know, we were trying everything we could. After the fact, my group is, it's unclear how effective that dispersant was. So the dispersant clearly did something, but the actual dispersant of the, the physical oil and gas going through that wellhead at that pressure, it was, it was self-dispersing, if you will. It's unclear. And, and so the, the oil companies, uh, 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 various responders will tell you, oh, the dispersants did it. The reason we didn't have as, as horrible an impact in the near shore as we otherwise would have was totally due to our dispersant. I think there's very little evidence to support that. We've published stuff, and I've argued in the peer-reviewed literature with the American Petroleum Institute, that, um, that I could be totally wrong, but they have essentially no data to support their argument that the dispersants worked very well. Uh, so there's a debate. So how much did the dispersants work? Were they 10% of the, of the lack, 10% uh, of keeping the oil off the shores? Was it 30%, whatever? Um, they have essentially no data to argue this, and they've pushed policy and other response um, protocols that rely heavily on dispersants, and I would argue that uh, I could be wrong, but I would like to see the data before we spend all this money and all these resources adding additional compounds to the environment. Um, so, we, so we do this kind of stuff, uh, respond to the refugio oil spill. A couple examples of that um, are some traditional ecotox stuff. So on the right are sand crabs. So this is a picture, uh, this is, um, this is uh, Ventura Beach. And the neat thing about this spill from an, an, from an academic perspective was uh, a lot of it was went offshore and then everybody said, it's all done, it's all good. We weren't allowed to fly our aerial drones to map it because we were told it was a dangerous thing, we couldn't do that. It mostly went offshore and then after two days people said, ah, oh, it's all gone. Turns out it started dolloping back as you guys all know, we started getting these tarball incidents. And so really, really interesting, it decoupled the impact from the traditional proximity to the source. So typically you get the oil spill starts, right, as you guys know, and then there's the most exposure right next to the source, and then as you get a little bit farther, there's a little bit less, you get farther, a little bit less, et cetera. This was, was totally decoupled. So we would get, you'd go three, four miles, no oil, and then all of a sudden you'd get heavy oiling, and then you'd go a quarter mile and there'd be light oiling, then you'd go another quarter mile and there'd be no oiling, and then you'd go another quarter mile and there'd be more. So, so it allowed us to decouple stuff. And so this picture that I took, which was um, Ventura Beach ran in all these newspapers, um, uh, that's a different story. So on the right though, so we did traditional um, ecotox exposures. In this case, these, this is a different concentration of oil and these different replicate treatments um, uh, using sand crabs, the critters that live right here where the, where the tar balls were concentrating. And so without going into all the details, but just see if you just look at visually right here, these guys, which these are the eggs from these crabs that resulted, this is after um, uh, I think about two weeks of exposure. Um, 
what you see is these guys have eye spots. So these, these larvae are developing, these embryos are developing normally. These guys on the left exposed to um, a moderate amount of tar, they don't have eye spots and they have a lot of malformation, so clear, direct impact. So we're doing that kind of work. We're also doing this, this interdisciplinary stuff. So for example, let's look at this thing right here. This is, um, we measured, we measured uh, amount of oil and, or amount of tar balls, I should say, uh, oil deposition and public opinion poll surveys, socioeconomic surveys on 33 different beaches from, from northern Santa Barbara to southern Los Angeles County. And this is what you see. This, this question is, how far did you drive to get to this beach you're at today? And then this on the x-axis, this is how much tarring happened. So six is the max amount of tarring. This is no tar balls at all. And long story short, there's no significant effect of how far people traveled to get to the beach to, uh, based on how much tar was there. So, so they drove just as far if there was a lot of tar versus if there's no tar. But if you ask them on the lower graph how much money they spent, either the past week, if they've been there for a week, or if they just arrived, how much money they were intending to spend on the upcoming week, strongly affected. So the areas that got a lot of tar, people spent very little money on, so they basically left early. The beaches with light tarring, people spent, you know, got the regular amount of hotels, they, they spent the regular amount of money in, in uh, restaurants, et cetera. And so this is the kind of research that, that, uh, that we like to do that, that helps answer questions for you guys that maybe isn't a traditional biological question, it's not a typical economics question, but it sort of merges all of these, you know, air quality, water quality, human reaction, all that stuff together. And that's where our, our strength is, I would argue. Yeah. What are the API gravities on these skulls? Uh, they vary. Um, the stuff in the stuff in the Gulf was primarily very light crude, a very light, sweet crude. The stuff in the case of the Refugio spill was very heavy, a lot of asphalts and stuff like that. So that stuff was 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 much thicker, uh, by and large. Like eight, thirteen. Uh, I want to say thirteen. Well, uh, maybe more like eleven. I, I don't remember exactly, but something like that. Oh. Um, okay, so then uh, we have a, in addition to all this various research that we do with our students, we also, which might be particularly interesting to you guys or your, or your, your groups, we have a year-long capstone requirement, a year-long research requirement that our students have to do to graduate. And so um, a lot of these questions come from the students themselves. And so this is uh, Dorothy that was just with us down in Costa Rica with our class. She's now in a PhD program up in Oregon. but. Um, but so she was helping us with our beach stuff and she said, hey, so we started looking at microplastics and she said, hey, are these, are these sand crabs, which are filter feeders, and these small microplastics defined as less than five millimeters, a lot of times much smaller than that, it's the same size as the food particles they're ingesting. Hey, do these, these sand crabs eat, eat microplastics? And I said, I don't know, why don't you find out? So we did a trial. So she did this first trial, which we got some labeled uh, uh, colored pieces, small piece of plastic we put a crab in here, left it for 24 hours with an air stone, and then some control crabs. And then at the end, since we're biologists, we kill things, because that's what biologists do. And so we, we cut open this crab. He had 94 pieces of plastic in his, in his gut, a colored plastic that we put in. And we're like, wow, that's crazy. Great. So we started thinking about projects. I said, whoa, whoa before you do, why don't you kill the control crab just for the heck of it? Kill the control crab, obviously none of our label plastic, but all kinds of other plastic. And so what we've since discovered is we've sampled uh, 51 beaches across California. Every, actually it's more than this now, this is an old slide. So, so more closer to 100 beaches, every single beach has microplastics on it. Every single beach we've looked at across the world now, across the South Pacific and the Mediterranean, uh, off the coast of South America, wherever you wanna pick, every single site has microplastics. And of the po animal population we've been looking at on these beaches, um, every, uh, every single population of crabs has ingested these microplastics. So uh, we're now following it up through the food web and trying to do human exposure estimates. Um, in addition to that, uh, so we started, the, we started this with sand, and then we migrated to these sand crabs, and now we're working on fish following to the food web. These guys, sand, there's tons of microplastics. Easy, boom, no problem. 
These guys, easy to dissect, take about five minutes or so to cut through their guts and look for the plastics, pretty easy. These guys, these vertebrates, have very complex digestive tracts. So it takes more like 20 minutes, 25 minutes, half an hour to, to, to go through them. So when our student first started working on this project, he started, didn't find many microplastics, but he found these much longer pieces of plastic, fibrous pl pieces of plastic, and they were all blue color. The stuff we find in the sand and in, in these uh, crabs, they're, they're pinks, they're, they're purples, they're all kinds of stuff. He was finding mostly blue stuff. He found some other things, but mostly blue stuff. And we're wondering about what's going on. So we realized this is our brand new building with HEPA filters, all the new bells and whistles. And I said, why don't we put out some, some glass petri dish to make sure there's no contaminant in the air? Guess what? There's contaminants in the air. So now we do this in a, in a clean room. Turns out our magical filtration system uses plastic as the main, as the main filter media. <laughs> And so our clean building is providing airborne microplastics that everybody is being exposed to. So, so a whole other new venue that we're looking at is we're designing some sampling equipment to actually measure indoor microfiber uh, you know, volumes inside. And so, um, so, th so this research has started with the student's curiosity that's then led to this new collaboration. Now we're being written into some different statewide plans to monitor this has now been leading to direct human ingestion um, uh, research. So, uh, so microplastics, it's a microplastic world. Um, we also use our, our drones and all kinds of other things. In this case, this is some of our behavioral work, looking at calf adult um, uh, behavior. In this case, how close does the calf stay to the mom? And, and historically, people did this from boats, hard to see stuff. Our drones are the perfect vehicle. They don't, they don't disturb the behavior of the whales. We can accurately measure the size of the whales, how close they are to mom. So we can do all kinds of neat behavioral stuff with our work as well. Some of our work in the Cook Islands, where we actually think we can get, get at coral banding disease. We think this might be coral banding disease through using hyperspectral stuff. In this case, with some of our robots using different uh, frequency of light and then different filters um, that we think we can do maybe autonomous monitoring of offshore reefs to look at uh, a stress and disease and things like that. Again, all student-driven projects. In this case, this is a collaboration between us and this guy is a grad student at Plymouth Marine Lab in the UK. So we have a lot of, we have a growing number of international collaborations as well as collaborations with other universities here in the, in the US. And then we have things like the Thomas fires. This is the Thomas fire. Obviously, we all know about the, the craziness that ensued in early December. Um, one of the neat things that our technology has been able to help with is, is some of the few positive stories that have come out. There's so much, so much horror and, and, and sadness. In this case, this is a wall uh, above the City Hall in Ventura. This is above the Ventura Botanical, or this is in the Ventura Botanical Gardens. And this is a wall that nobody knew about before the fires. This was vegetation that was 100 to 150 years old. Um, this was from the Mission era, but nobody, we knew there were some walls there, but this exposed all kinds of additional walls. So we've used our technology to do a high resolution map of this. And now that we're ending the, um, the rainy season, we're just about to go back and remap it. And then our, so if any of these walls, for example, have been covered by mud flows or debris flows, we will be able to go back and tell the botanical folks exactly where their archeologists can look and find these, these structures to do some neat um, you know, human history of this part of Ventura. So we can use this stuff in a whole variety of things, not just in traditional science approaches. We can also use it to do stuff like this. So this is one of our models. This is from, this is a low resolution run, but this is the beach at Carpinteria. The left side is all of the deposition, the, um, the debris flows that have been dumped. So they are dumping material and then bulldozing it into the beach. So we, we couldn't get an accurate answer from, uh, from Santa Barbara County as to what the area was, so we just went out and mapped it. And so this is from about a, a 10 minute flight. And, uh, and this is just, again, this is normally, we, I could have the computer open and play it, but this is just in case we didn't have internet, this is just a student walking through the map. But what you're seeing here is reconstructed beach. This isn't a photo of a beach. This is the computer map, the, the topographic map that we've made of the beach and then restretched photos over it. So, um, so it's a really powerful tool for doing quantification in space in a whole variety of contexts. Um, 
So we have that stuff going on. We also yeah. It's nine o'clock. So we yeah. Probably awesome. I'm yeah, almost done. Soon. So here we go. So this is we also use a variety of of, of technology such as uh, open source stuff to do geospatial ma mapping. In this case, this is publicly reported mortality events from the Thomas fire. This is uh, wildlife kills. So we can look at where wildlife kills were the, were the most abundant, and we're doing a lot with, with animal mortality in the wake of the fire. But these tools are all primarily, or we use them to do uh, education stuff. But then when we have a disaster or a need, we can turn the, those educational skills into a, a real world application. And then coastal polling, but we're out of time. But I can talk about it. The long story short is, when you ask, I think this is the one you guys are most interested in. We have about 47 different questions, but I'll just end with this. So this guy right here, we ask people to rank the threats to various things. In this case, the general coastline of California, coastal wetlands, and they rank things between one and four. So one being the greatest threat, four being the least threat. And we've seen this pattern year after year after year after year, which is when people say, what are the greatest threats to, the, to our, our surrounding environment? Pollution is by far the number one threat. Everybody thinks pollution, pollution, pollution is it. Not fragmentation of landscapes, not over harvesting, not invasive species, nothing else. Pollution is what the public thinks we should be working on and what they think is the greatest threat to our natural resources. So that's it. That's all I'm going to say. Stay in touch. Um, we have all kinds of resources. Go look at uh, any of our websites, piratelab.org. You can find all that stuff. And that is it. Thanks, you guys. Thanks Great. for having me. Thanks. So no worries.